Gavins, welcome to Australian Musician. G'day, Greg. Uh, we're here today we are because it's the uh, 75th uh, anniversary of Maiden Guitars this year. Uh, and as usual, Maiden always give us a, a special edition guitar to mark the, the milestone. When you're thinking about a milestone guitar, what kind of things are discussed? Um, we're usually looking at, at our history. We, we try and draw on something that uh, we want to highlight about our past. You know, when you get to 75 years, there's a lot of that. Um, and we have had a good number of milestones recently. So uh, we had the 70th anniversary you know, five years ago. Last year we had um, Vera May's 100th birthday. So we uh, designed a guitar to celebrate that. This time we wanted to, to really talk about where we are now. So as much as where we've come from, we wanted to highlight what we're doing now uh, and to showcase that. Yeah. Oh, well, tell me about uh, the guitar and the materials uh, used in its construction. So this is our 75th anniversary guitar. It's um, a few things special about it. The first thing is the shape. It is uh, at what we call our traditional shape, uh, which is a little larger than our 808 that, that everyone knows, and but not as big as a dreadnought. So it, tonally, it, it's a new soundscape for us, I suppose. Um, we've been doing this in custom shop for a good while, but this is the first time we've ventured into it with production. The, that shape is um, a shape that I've been using for a while down in the custom shop, and I thought, you know, that's a great idea to bring something new to the floor. Um, I think it will be quite successful. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great shape. It has a different sound to the, what we're used to out there. Was there a particular sound or tone you were aiming for? Um, well, I, I think Pat was shooting for the tone at the time on this one. Um, the blackwood we know very well and how, how it sounds, and uh, Pat's very au okay with the, um, the 808 sound. Um, we've been using blackwood now for a lot of years. Um, our blackwood supplier down in the Otways, um, we've got a very good relationship with the Blackwood, so I think that was a no-brainer when we've come up with the Blackwood for the, the sound. And then there was a little bit of tweaking involved that Pat had to do um, to bring the guitar out, but I think it's uh, proofs in the pudding there. In the custom shop, we were, we were basically... Um, I was always looking for something new to develop. We have sort of three main models here at Mate, and from the 808 to the standard size guitar to the jumbo guitar, and just looking for something new um, to work on. And the obvious was this triple O sort of shape. Um, we call it traditional. It's uh, it is a very traditional shaped guitar. So I started playing on this um, probably five years ago now, um, where we. We're developing the bracing inside it, you know, just getting its voice right for Maiton. That's a big thing too, you know, because you can, you can go down other roads and, you know, have it sort of very bassy and flappy and all that. But we do have a very distinct sound. So somewhere within the traditional triple O sound and the Maiton iconic sound, um, we've managed to get what I'm pretty happy with and, uh, and the rest of the world seems pretty happy too. Um, recently, Eric Johnson uh, started playing the, the traditional that I make, which this, this one's um, number 1300 out of the custom shop. And um, Eric Johnson's playing a similar one just without all the bling on it. It's just basic rosewood, you know, very standard formula. So, yeah, the guitar has evolved over the years, you know, I mean, all our product has, so we're always trying to, you know, step one, one step forward. So in the custom shop, I, I can go down different roads and, and have a bit of a look around. And, uh, and then when we see something that is, um, you know, working or worthwhile or whatever, you know, inevitably we can implement that onto the floor. We've focused on materials that are really important to us, not only historically, but now. 
So we've got double A grade black wood back and sides uh, with some figure in it, which I hope you can see. Um, and blackwood, we think this this blackwood comes from the Otway Ranges. We think it's an amazing tone wood. Uh, it would appear the rest of the world is cutting onto that idea as well. So we're getting inquiries, you know, from all over the world for blackwood. It's it is a beautiful tone wood. It has its own voice. Um, so the, and that's a large part of our success in recent times too. So we chose to highlight blackwood. We have Queensland maple on the neck. And this is actually figured Queensland maple. It's got some lovely quilting on it. Um, that is a timber we've been using since the outset, since 1946. But it's played an enormous role in our, uh, in our recent years. Pro you know, very much so since, say, 95 or thereabouts. Uh, so it's a really significant timber. Uh, we've got Sitka spruce on the soundboard. And Sitka is our go-to for consistent, high-performing soundboards. Um, we use it right across the range. This is AAA Sitka, which means the grain's nice and tight. The runouts, while well, there is no runout, it's very even. Um, tonally, highly responsive and really dynamically responsive. So it'll go with you depending on how you're playing it. Um, fingerboard and bridge is ebony, which is a timber that we've always used, but until the CITES situation a couple of years ago with Rosewood, we only used it on, you know, less than 10% of our, our production. It's now pretty much across our range, with one or two exceptions. And um, we've learned a lot about ebony in the last couple of years. We've learned to, to um, manage it, dry it, and have it behave at, a, at an optimum level. And uh, so this is a bit of a celebration of that. Um, the headstock veneer is also ebony and we have a mother of pearl diamond inlay there to represent 75 years. And the electronics? Electronics are the AP5 Pro. Uh, so that's with a piezo under the bridge and the microphone inside, which we use as a blend. Um, the AP5 Pro has followed on from the AP5 uh, as a pretty much an industry standard. It's it's well regarded and one of those pickups that whenever you go to a festival or wherever you hear a mate on, you can hear the AP5 Pro and it's it's always good. It's a really easy pickup to get a good sound of, you know, at a festival stage or an open mic stage or something like that, as well as uh, at the top level where they've got sound checking and and uh, tuning and so forth. Um, what was the, the prototype process? Was there much back and forth, much tweaking along the way? Um, so this one was actually designed through the lockdown. Uh, in Melbourne we went into lockdown um, <clears throat> July, August, September and um, most of the design work on this was done then. Um, so there was a bit of thinking to do. Obviously we had a new shape, so we had to um, make new jigs, bending irons, that sort of thing. That was all done, designed through that period. Um, did a lot of work on the bracing in particular. Um, we basically took what's worked for us with the 808 series, extended it and looked very carefully at where we were going to have the nodal points around the soundboard. Uh, to get optimum response. So it's forward shifted X brace, scalloped X brace, scalloped tone bars. Um, and I think we've really got it right with this. It's, uh, sometimes when you prototype a design for the first time, it actually works. Not all the time, but sometimes it does, and this did. So uh, apart from that, we also put the build through our master builders or the people that have been with us for a good while. So you know, builders with 10 years plus experience uh, right through to make sure that we, we got everything exactly right. Um, and these two are the prototypes. Um, I'm very happy with them. Everyone that's played them is really happy with them. I think we've hit the mark um, both tonally and aesthetically. Uh, it's also a ultra thin gloss stained finish which is something that's um, 
a bit new for us. We've done it over the years from time to time, but we've never managed to do it before as thinly as this. So we're not, you know, we're not impeding the tone at all by having the stain. So that's exciting too. Um, this is, I think this is pretty much first time as a production we finish as a burst under the gloss paint. We always have a burst finish in satin paint, but not for the gloss paint. Um, we actually had really, uh, we spent good time to sort of investigating and uh, experimenting to get the best finish um, under the grass finish gloss uh, with a nice um, faded burst finish. And uh, that was about the same time when Pat was um, sort of planning to getting a 75th anniversary um, ideas. Then um, that was by the time, pretty much the same time that all those experiments has been pretty much confirmed and then we had uh, enough confidence to let it finish as a burst gloss. So yeah, Pat sort of um, was more than happy to introduce that our new, new step or new level of our finish into those 75th anniversary, yeah. Well, the finish is very important. That, that, that um, really determines sort of what you've done to the guitar. Uh, over the years, different finishes have been uh, sought after. You know, people want a real glassy, flat finish that, you know, stays like that forever. Um, obviously, you've got your old nitro finishes that, you know, in time with the weather and all, they start doing the weather checking and cracking up, which now is... Uh, really sought after to the point of the relicers who get out with the razor blades and actually, um, you know, simulate that, that crack up. So somewhere between, you know, the, the sound of the old softer nitro finish and the harder UV finish, um, Atsu got in there and he, he, he developed somewhere in the middle there. And it, it actually has a better look to it than the real high, high gloss, glassy finish. You can see it's more of a vintage, type of paint job on it. Um, the thinner finish, of course, lets the guitar do its magic. So uh, we're all pretty happy with where, where Atsu's got that finish too, so. Um, so the process of spraying this guitar is we basically um, apply the primary into the timber. So our timber doesn't get bleed out after finishes. And then after that, we, uh, we apply the grain fill to uh, fill the grains to not get uh, dead flat. Then um, seal a coat, then we stain the guitar. Yeah. Uh, we've got like special ratio to finish that, that we have um, enough adhesion and then also to get the best result of expressing the finishing. Then after stain, we just put the top coat, knock it off flat, then uh, hit with buffing for the polishing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it a limited edition guitar? It's limited in, in terms of time. So we'll continue to make it for a period of time. Um, it's not limited in number. So um, when the gate's shut, that'll be that. As to when that is, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but um, it'll be available regardless of numbers up until that cutoff point. And when will it be available? When can people? Uh, it'll be available around March, April. Uh, it'll, be, it'll become available. Um, marketing will commence before that, but um, March is often an important month for us in, or May is also an important month for us in May, so it'll be in that period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 2020 was a tough year for everyone, uh, particularly mm. the arts and mm. arts-related uh, uh, people and companies. Um, what did the lockdown do to the business of making guitars for Maiden? Well, it stopped us. <laughs> Quite frankly, we, uh, we had eight weeks of, of nothing. Um, we were able to come in and do a little bit of maintenance here or there. Um, I did a lot of work at home you know, on, on this and, and a few other things, but a lot of the, you know, most of the people were at home kind of waiting to get back into it. Um, how long have you been? at Mayton and what have been some of the highlights for you? Well, I've been here since March 1993, so I'm coming up for 28 years. Um, highlights, it's, it's, it's a hard one to pick. I, I, I can think of several. 
I think they fall into two, ca two categories. There's um, kind of anything that Tommy Emmanuel's involved with as a highlight. And, and I remember travelling with him in Europe in 97 when he was in his sort of early days breaking into that market. That was definitely a highlight. Um, uh, meeting and getting to know Joe Robinson, Michael Fix, Nick Charles, Andre Valeri, lots of great mate on players has been a highlight. Um, as you get older though, there are other things and, and getting to see people that started with you when they were very young uh, coming through and growing into really good guitar makers uh, over time, that's really special. So you're able to sort of have an input on that and, and see that grow too. Of all the, all the guitars that you've produced, are there one or two that are closer to your heart than others? Oh, I like to think every one I make is the best one I've ever made. Um, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of making guitars for some pretty big names over the years, so whatever the latest name is, you know, it's normally pretty special to us to, um, to be working on. Yeah. Um, 75 years of Mayton, uh, you've been here for 27, something 27, like that? 27, yeah, something like that, yeah. Uh, what about some of your personal highlights? Uh, personal highlights uh, would be Jimmy Page. Um, you know, can't top that one really. I know everybody always asks me about that one, but hey, I'm an old Led Zeppelin fan, so to make it for your idols, pretty um, pretty special, you know. But then we've done a lot over the years, you know, John Fogarty, and then we've got all the um, guys like Tommy Emmanuel. I'm privileged enough to make all of Tommy's guitars for the last 20 odd years. Um, John Butler, Neil Finn, all, all the top end Aussie artists. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Page was aware of making guitars. Um, yeah, yeah, he was actually. Um, it's quite surprising how far Mayton got in the world, to be honest, you know, with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and everything. So when um, Jimmy Page uh, and our management at the time uh, approached, he, he was all up for it. He, he knew our name. He had one back in 1961 or something like that, you know, and he was really keen to see where we were at at the, at, at the time. And um, yeah, invited us along to hang out backstage with him and be part of the show. It was really good. Uh, you've presented us with the, the Diamond uh, 75th anniversary guitar. Uh, are there any other plans to celebrate the 75th birthday? Um, there'll be a whole lot of things. Um, you probably need to stay tuned for those. Yeah. Uh, what's left for Maiton to achieve? What are the goals going forward? Um, well, we want to do what we do well and more of it. Um, we're still very much uh, in our early stages of being a, a major exporting company and, and having presence on the world stage. Um, so expect to see a lot more of us around the world in various markets. Um, the other thing is going to be continuing to improve the instruments. Um, we're in a bit of a golden age of luthiery now. There are so many great acoustic guitars being made by makers all around the world and, and that means the bar continues to rise. We need to rise with that, um, so I expect to see that. There probably will be in, um, developments in alternative materials. I think that's, that's going to be a challenge. It already has been as with the ebony situation. Um, so, you know, embracing that and, and um, finding ways to use that and to create better and better instruments, I think, going to be an ongoing challenge and keeps us interested. All right, Patrick, thanks for your time. My pleasure.